Today we're talking with Arash Azarbazin, newly appointed CEO of SH Hotels and Resorts. Arash is in charge of some of the coolest, eco-friendly, sustainable, luxury lifestyle hotels on the planet today. Say that 10 times fast. Including the one hotel brand, Treehouse and Baccarat. And if you find yourself in Miami, be sure to stop by the One Hotel South Beach, which has to be the hottest hotel today with its $1,600 ADR. And maybe you too can find out personally what curbside sanitation is all about. Gosh, thank you for joining me today on Teak Talks. Uh, you're a good man for being here. I'm sure Barry put you up to it. But You know, it, it's a pleasure to be here and, and uh, uh, it's very difficult to say no to, to Mrs. Thornlick. So happy to be here. We know the feeling. So for starters, congratulations on the promotion, CEO, SH Hotels and Resorts. Uh, thank you, sir. It's a, it's a great honor and a, and a privilege, and uh, I'm excited to uh, help uh, SH uh, grow to new heights in the coming years. And, you know, we made it through the pandemic, and then when Barry asked me to uh, take the title, uh, he pretty much told me, you're doing the job anyways, might as well have the title. And I wasn't one to uh, uh, argue with him on that point, that's for sure. That's good. We finally got Barry out of your way. Now we good. That's not the case, sir, and, and that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm excited to be here, because I get to collaborate with Barry, and he's such an incredible visionary and, and someone that I've been doing this for a long time, but having him and, and his mind involved in what we do from a design and delivery and sustainability is, is a core principle. So uh, by no means he's out of the way, but uh, he's very involved or as involved as he wants to be, but uh, he's definitely the force behind our group. All right, so I love it. So we agree, Barry's one of the great visions of our visionaries of our industry. Uh, we can all learn a lot, and he's done a bunch. And you get to put his visions into action uh, and bring them about. And you guys are lead, you're doing it. Listen, I, we'll get into it. I, I got some more questions, but you're doing it on the operations side, on the cleanliness side, on the sustainability side, uh, on the brands, the one, the Treehouse, the Baccarat, great brands, creating some from scratch. Uh, so I think you guys, kudos. I think you guys are doing a great job. Thank you, sir. I want to start, as I do with everyone, of how did you get into this business? So I know you're born in Iran, came to the U.S. I know the culinary school background and the luxury background. But please, I want to hear in your words, what drew you to this business? Sure. I, I, I always say this business found me. Uh, I, I didn't find this business. I, I went to school for computer science back in Connecticut, and I was hoping to be an engineer. You know, coming from Iran, you had to be an engineer, doctor, lawyer, accountant. You know, there's you know, uh, anything in hospitality wasn't looked uh, nicely, you know, from, from the homeland. You get that and idea. I never forget uh, when I went and told my parents that I wanted to go to culinary school. They're like, what? You want to be a cook? Are you crazy? Uh, but that's how it all started. I, I started cooking to pay uh, for my way through college, and I really enjoyed it. And after I graduated, I decided to... Uh, go to CIA, and uh, I, I had a passion for the culinary and hospitality side, learned a lot. And after graduating from, uh, from CIA, I cooked for a good seven, eight years in different restaurants uh, and, and operations in the East Coast. But I quickly realized that to become a great chef, and remember, we're talking late 80s now, early 90s, celebrity chefs weren't as big as they are today back then. I wasn't an artist. And, and to be a great celebrity chef, you have to be an artist. You have to think about new ideas and new concepts. And I used to read recipes from a cookbook to come up with my specials. Remember, we didn't have internet back there either. I'm definitely dating myself. <laughs> uh, but I, I started realizing that I could be a great executive chef at a big resort in, in Vegas or a big hotel in New York, but I couldn't be a celebrity chef. And, and that's where I decided to come to the front of the house and I remember taking a huge pay cut uh, from cooking and running a FMB operation to become a bar manager at the Four Seasons Hotel in Newport Beach. I'm talking about a 70% pay cut because, you know, Four Seasons was a great and still is a great training ground for hospitality. And I spent seven, eight years with Four Seasons and did all the different uh, FMB uh, operations within the company between Los Angeles and Seattle. And then this very young, talented man named Barry Sternlich put this company together called Starwood Hotels and Resorts. And I had an opportunity to join the group in the Phoenician in Arizona as director of food and beverage. And 
it was a beautiful opportunity because it was a new company. It was growing fast. We needed leadership quickly and, and, and it helped propel my career. You know, at a young age of 33, I became a general manager of the St. Regis Hotel in, in Century City, which doesn't exist anymore. It's a beautiful condo building now. And then helped uh, and played a small role in launching the W brand with Barry. Because at the time, Barry was, uh, the W was very popular, it was fun, it was energetic, great music, uh, but it wasn't, we really have luxury in its DNA. And Barry wanted to kind of insert some substance to the service and to the quality. He, he used to say, you know, you can, uh, you don't know if you're going to receive your faxes at the W. Remember, again, I'm dating myself. But we, we joined the W group. I, I ran the five W's in New York and, and, and really helped bring W to a new height. I opened four or five uh, W's as a, as a task force. And it was an incredible experience because being a luxury minded individual for all my career and adding the lifestyle to it, it, it became uh, something that was, you know, where lifestyle hotels have really begun to do. You know, it's not about just having fun, it's about having substance in it. Uh, when Barry left Starwood, uh, I left Starwood as well. Not that we were close. I mean, he was my boss's 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 boss, but you know, he really was the, the force behind Starwood Hotels and I didn't want to stay. Uh, and the W brand was not what he was without Barry. So I joined uh, SBE in Los Angeles, Sam Nazarian, another phenomenal entrepreneur. And we helped uh, founded SBE Hotel Group and, and we launched the SLS brand, and which was really the luxury lifestyle component of it and Redberry and we bought a casino in Vegas and we, we helped build a lot of F&B brand with Jose Andreas and Michael Mina and Chef Katsuya and Chef Danny and, and it was a one of a kind operation where we were one of the first companies to be a fully integrated, you know, we had our own nightlife division, restaurant division, hotel division and, and it was extraordinary to bring them all under one roof. And, and lastly, I'm not going to take too much time. When Barry calls, uh, you don't, uh, you don't, uh, uh, you don't go back. So Barry called me uh, about uh, three years ago to join him and lead SH, and and I've been uh, at SH since. So it's been about uh, three years here. So we all forget, but I like to blame Barry for the uh, bed wars that we can't. I mean, remember he created the heavenly bed at the Westin back in the day. He was the one. Why are we spending all this money on? Furniture, the bed is the most important thing, and we've ignored the bed. So he's been a leader for a long time. It, little things like having a TV in front of you, so you, when you sleep in your bed or work in your, or, or on your desk, you can watch TV if you wish. Little things like that uh, uh, meant a lot, and, and we always forget that the number one purpose for a hotel is to have a good night rest, for most business travelers anyway. So. He definitely thinks outside the box and, and, and from heavenly shower to heavenly bed to the W bed, it was all his, his thinking and his vision. And the W brand was new, iconic, lifestyle, nothing we'd really ever seen before. Uh, so he's been a visionary out front the entire time. At now, uh, one, I mean, luxury lifestyle, I get it, but he's also got all the sustainability stuff in there. Talk to me about what sustainability means, what eco-friendly means in the hotel world. Right. Let's not forget, W was definitely a brainchild of Barry, but also building the St. Regis brand from a single hotel to now, you know, a few dozen hotels around the world and, and making Weston what it is today. When he bought Weston, it was, you know, it was a stable brand, but he helped you know, put it on the world map and making the Sheraton brand even better. So he was he is and was definitely a, a brand pioneer. But back in 2007, uh, when he started the idea behind 2006, seven. Uh, behind one hotel. It was really combination of all the best of the best that he had learned from the hotel business. You know, he wanted the hotel to feel natural. He wanted the hotel to feel uh, ahead of his time, eco-friendly. And then one of his favorite quotes is, you know, you don't, uh, you can, you can be green and still be luxurious. And, and that's one of the common cores of our, of our brand, one hotel and treehouse, the sister brand is, to build a hotel that's sustainable from, from inception to opening. Uh, we use repurposed material, we use the, the be, source the best we can to make sure that we, our carbon footprint is, is minimal. 
and, and most, if not all of our one hotels are at least lead uh, uh, certified. You know, some of them are lead gold and lead silver as well. And, and that's the start of our, of our journey. Uh, Barry wants to give back as much as he can to the world. And, and we want to leave the world better uh, for our kids that, that we were left with. So every hotel has a sustainability uh, uh, plan. Every hotel recycles everything possible. Uh, no, uh, we minimize any paper or any plastic in our hotel. And uh, you know, energy monitoring uh, from an hour by hour. You know, we, we weigh our trash every month before it goes out. So we know how much waste we're putting out there. And a concept that we started this year called Zero Waste Kitchens. Uh, we've had zero waste dinners. Now we're doing zero waste kitchens. And it's not that difficult to have minimal waste when you cook if you think about it and come up with the menu accordingly. Again, you guys are incredible in what you're doing. I think you're out front, even now on what I'll call the operations in this COVID world where we are. Your protocols for operations, for cleanliness, for keeping people safe and distance are, uh, are forefront. And you're sharing what you've learned with everyone. Talk about that, please. You know, I, I give a, a lot of credit to the WIN organization. I mean, that was the first plan I saw, uh, opening plan, and, and uh, they published it online. It was 27 pages. And, and when I saw that, I mean, that gave me hope for our industry, that we're not here uh, to keep best practices from each other, especially when it comes time to people's safety, you know, our employees, our guests, our vendors. And that really energized us to say, hey, if, if WIN with 4,000 rooms and 8,000 employees can open safely, we can do the same. So we got into work, we had task force, we talked to the best in class from you know, the temperature controlled cameras, thermal control cameras that we have at all of our entrances. You know, it's kind of odd when you go to somewhere and they put the little temperature gun on you. I mean, yes. you know, we do this uh, seamlessly behind the scene. And, having protocols from cleaning and sealing the room and, and making sure there's three steps of inspection before anybody goes into the room. And, you know, we, we opened uh, our, our hotel in South Beach in June. So we were well ahead of uh, the time. There were two months before all our competitors opened up uh, because we felt that we could open it safely and we can open it as securely as possible. And, and all our hotels are open now. And, and uh, the protocols that we have put into place have only made us better. And I really don't think you know, some of these protocols are going to go away, at least for the next two or three years, uh, because this is, you know, we're in a business of creating safe, clean environment for our guests. And, and this will continue uh, in, in, the, in the months coming. So let's get to some of these details, because I think they're important. Uh, one of my favorites is curbside sanitation. It sounds like where waste management comes and picks up my trash can from my house. So I don't have to roll it to the curb. <laughs> but what does it mean in your world? You know, we have these UV wands that, that we use that, that do sanitize and do kill all on, on surface uh, materials. So we, we, we wand your, your luggage when you arrive. And, uh, you know, that's the curbside when, when you arrive to the hotel. But we also have many different ionizers that, that we, you know, use it in the elevators to make sure that, you know, the air and all the particles that are there are clean. And, and we do enforce masks strictly. You know, it's much easier to enforce masks in New York State and, and, and California. But in Florida, you'd be surprised how hard it is for, for folks to actually wear masks. But we take it seriously and we enforce it. And we have refused service to guests that don't want to wear masks because it's important for us to keep the environment safe for everyone around you. Uh, and I'm sure you're providing PPE kits to all that want them, put them in every room. Uh, your mobile app, which you started in 19, uh, has been very yeah. beneficiary today, right? Uh, the irony comes in handy. You know, it, it, uh, in, in Central Park, you can already use your mobile app to uh, uh, get access to your room. So your mobile key is working in Central Park, and soon in South Beach and all our hotels will work. But you can order your room service. You can pre-order food at our cafe downstairs so you don't have to wait in line. You can just come down and pick it up and you can make spa reservations. And, and our app actually was launched in, yeah, in, in early 2019. So we're, you know, for a small company, I think we've been ahead of the curve on, on having the uh, very user-friendly app at your disposal. Uh, and I got to give you final credit. Uh, new position you guys created, Director of Environmental Health and Safety, which I believe you guys implemented in October. 
Delta Airlines and others just implemented it last month. Actually, we did it uh, in July. So July, we're even earlier than that. And we, we, every one of our hotels now has a di uh, director of environmental health and safety. And these people are the champions for our standards and making sure that every step in our cleaning protocol and, and, and operations protocol that we put for COVID uh, is going to be in place. And by the way, we're not eliminating the position you know, once COVID is over. I think we're going to keep that in place and have this person champion more sustainable and, and, and sustainability goals once COVID is hopefully a, a, a memory in the past. So this is going to continue. And you know, we take this very, very seriously. More importantly, not only for our guests, but for our, for our team members as well to make sure that we have a you know, safe, clean environment. I mean, dare I ask how we're even coming up with these ideas, but, uh, and I, I don't know, you've got the one hotel in China. I don't know if you learn with that visibility, if you learn stuff that you can bring back to the States or not, but it kind of helps. It, it sure does. You know, China, it's, it's, a, it's a, a different world to a certain extent uh, because the Chinese government and Chinese people take these protocols seriously. Where in the U.S., and again, I don't want to get into politics, they don't take it as seriously. When they tell you that if you're feeling sick, you stay home, they, they will stay home. They will respect these protocols. Nobody comes out without a mask. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that we didn't, uh, we, we went to all these peaks and valleys is because, you know, Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving, you know, a peak, and then Christmas, a peak, and New Year's Eve, a peak, uh, where this, this didn't happen as much in China. And, and right now, if you see uh, our hotel in China, the staff is sort of wearing masks, but the guests are not wearing masks anymore because they feel uh, that they've gotten the pandemic in order and, and, and a good number of vaccinations going to place. So I, I am confident that we will get there here in the U.S. as well. It's just taking us a little bit longer. Uh, let's continue talking about markets and what you're seeing in the different markets because I think that's important as well. So you've got one Manhattan, Central Park, you've got one Brooklyn, you've got West Hollywood, We've got South Beach. What are you noticing from the different markets? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the market that has been impacted the most uh, positively has been South Beach. Uh, uh, being a resort destination, a drive destination, a New York City destination, I think, you know, we, we thank God for the snowstorms that he sent uh, New York uh, this year. More snow than we've had in the past few years. Uh, I'll give you a statistic. In, in January of this year, from an NOI perspective, our hotel in South Beach almost beat last January pre-COVID numbers, which is, to me, crazy, uh, but true, because people are uh, afraid of traveling, getting on the plane. The Caribbean is difficult to get to. Hawaii is impossible to get to. You can't go to Belize or any other exotic destination. So we've been very fortunate to have a uh, good response in South Beach and our pace for February is amazing. And, you know, we, we were almost sold out this, this weekend, you know, at, at crazy record breaking rates. So it has been very promising for us in the travel industry to see that the discretionary spend is there and the demand is there. And I could have sold another 500 rooms this weekend if I had it. Uh, uh, so there's promising to see people want to get out. There's pent up demand that people need to travel. And, you know, this time of the year, Miami wasn't an international destination anyways. This is a peak season and internationals usually come in the summer to Miami. Uh, from the best to the worst market. Well, hang on, let me ask real fast. So one, I think you're being modest that, uh, cause yes, we see a lot of the, uh, hotels in Miami and South Beach doing really well, if not better than they were last year. But you guys are blowing away even the other hotels within Miami and within South Beach. So kudos to you guys. Thank and then you, my, and my other question is, where, where do you see most of the guests coming from? Uh, I, I would, first of all, for those of you who are listening to this that are hoteliers, if I told you that we have achieved 300% rep bar penetration uh, I think that that gives you a sense of how well we're doing in the market. I have to show off just a little bit. Uh, but most of the guests are coming from the, uh, the tri-state area. I would say 60, 65% of our business are coming from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and you know Philadelphia, DC, the, the Northeast corridor. That's the majority of our business coming down. We are getting a good chunk of business from California, especially you know, when we had full shutdown in California in January, no restaurants, indoor, outdoor. 
you know, we did get a good, good chunk of business from, from California and, and uh, Arizona as well. But majority of it is coming from the Northeast. Interesting. And wh what's the hotel experience like for the guests once they get there? You know, as safe as possible. You know, we do require masks when you're walking around. Uh, you know, I was in Las Vegas in the middle of the pandemic. And when I was lying around the pool in a lounge chair by myself, they made me wear a mask, which I thought it was crazy. So if you're sitting or, or if, even if you're sitting at the tip of the pool, you have to have a mask unless you were drinking. So, of course, I was drinking the whole time I was there because you know, uh, that's the only time you don't have to wear a mask. But here, you know, we don't allow uh, groups outside of your family unit to, you know, congregate together, you know, four or five people at most. Uh, restaurants are spaced out uh, as much as possible. Bars have the plexiglass in front of you. So we're doing our, our steps, but, you know, we have so much outdoor space in South Beach between the beach club and the rooftop and the sandbox and, and, and four pools that people can feel as at ease as possible in the middle of this craziness. And it's so great to actually walk into a hotel and see people around the pool safely and people having lunch or dinner at the beach club or, you know, being by the beach. A sense of normalcy, even. We need it, man. We all need it. We need it. All right. So that was the best. Now, now give me the worst. The worst. Yeah. I think the California, Los Angeles and San Francisco are feeling really the brunt of this, the worst. Uh, first of all, it's a state that has been, you know, uh, very, very tight on its controls. And I mentioned dining earlier uh, and, and having no entertainment business whatsoever, you know, movies, productions, commercials, TV shows, uh, forget about upfronts, the award season that disappeared uh, uh, this year, California has been hit the worst. And uh, until we have the entertainment business come back, you know, 70% of our business here in Southern California is somehow tied to the entertainment business. So we're having a hard time and lobbying to get that going safely. Uh, so that has been uh, the most difficult. And New York City is funny. Brooklyn opened up. We opened it up for the July weekend. And we had an incredible uh, uh, summer in Brooklyn. The occupancy is in the 70% on weekends and a lot of staycation. People from the tri-state would drive and we have a small pool in Brooklyn and a rooftop uh, a deck and a bar and an outdoor restaurant so by a park. You know, people really, really enjoyed it. But Manhattan was suffering a little bit because, you know, uh, no shopping and, and there was many different factors that slowed traffic uh, uh, over the summer. And now we're seeing the switch in you know, Manhattan, starting to see some light. Uh, this Valentine weekend, our Baccarat Hotel uh, was close to 70% occupancy, which is amazing. Uh, Central, Park was, uh, Central Park was at 50% and Brooklyn was at 60%. So we see some life coming back to the city. And, and you know, city has a lot, New York City has a lot to do with interna international travel. And we think you know, until that travel is back, you know, we won't get the normalcy at all but yeah when especially in the cities like new york and i don't know, even miami but when do you see the international traveler coming back i mean right let's we need the business traveler we need the convention traveler and then we need international especially in the May. when do you see any of that coming back you know we do have a, a small hotel in london uh, our treehouse hotel and, and we do get regular updates from what they're what's happening in uk and uk being the number one a provider of international travel for us in New York. Yeah, we just heard that they might not open restaurants and, and pubs in the UK till end of April. Uh, so if they're not opening pubs and restaurants, I, I just find it very hard that they're gonna open the borders and, and we're gonna open the borders. I think once the vaccination goes to a point that you can get a card that you've been vaccinated and this is a you know kind of your get out of jail pass, that's when I see the international travel start again. You know, United is starting their, you know, COVID testing at the airport, which is amazing. I don't know why we didn't think of that sooner. And other airlines, I'm sure, are going to get on the bandwagon. But flying safe is really, really important. And I feel, and you know, I've traveled a lot over the last uh, six months, and airplanes are one of the cleanest, safest places to be. Uh, and as long as you wear your mask and, and you follow simple protocols, uh, you're not, you know, you, you're probably riskier going to the supermarket than getting on a plane. 
But until the vaccination gets to a point that people can show proof that they have been vaccinated, I don't think international travel is going to come back as quickly as we thought it would. It could take, you know, to hopefully by this summer is our goal. And everybody's preparing for the summer season from Airbnb to hotel companies and lots of campaigns around safely traveling that we would hope to see some business come back from international destinations. I'm nervous that everything's taking longer than we wanted it to. So this summer may be optimistic, but I hope you're right. It, it sure is. You know, we, we predicted, you know, in our, you know, when we did our budgets, you know, one of our assumptions that was a vaccine is going to be approved by the end of the year. And, and sure enough, it was approved in December. Some vaccination went out. Uh, but I think, you know, the new federal mandate and, and the Biden administration starting the, you know, mobilizing the National Guards and having 20 or 30 federal sites open to vaccinate domestically, I think it will help. And, you know, again, I'm an optimist and, and I'm in the, uh, in the business of, of, of entertainment and memory. So I'm hoping by summer we'll see some air of normalcy. I can still hope. But I do agree that it might take a bit longer than that. All right, uh, let's stay optimistic, though, or, or at least pr predictions. Give me your predictions for the rest of 21, maybe even 22, what our industry looks like. You know, from, from the indications that are fact-based, when I say fact-based, lead generations, bookings on that we have, I think the second quarter is going to be very difficult uh, uh, for us all the way around because we haven't seen the results of the vaccine and all the work that goes around. But I have, and we have seen great leads, especially in, in New York, Miami, even West Hollywood for third and fourth quarter, uh, the groups that are at least checking and holding space. And then, you know, we're, we're being very flexible, of course, we don't know what to expect, but there is, you know, Zooming is great. And, and, and I think we have all learned how to work remotely. Uh, but the fact that, you know, networking and, and exchange of ideas and, and, and having really the team building sessions, very, very difficult to do it on Zoom. So lots of companies that haven't had a national meeting for a year, 18 months by the time this summer comes around are definitely seeking and looking at, at holding a big conference where they can bring the team together and they can strategize and they can get ready uh, for, for next year. So, you know, my, my guess and my, my educated, uh, based on what I know today, prediction is, we will, by fourth quarter of this year, hopefully by November, December of this year, we'll see some air of normalcy. And, and hopefully by second half of 2022, we get to 2019 numbers. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the thinking behind it. You know, we had a record year at all our hotels in 19, and it was a stellar year. So it's, uh, we will catch up. And, and, you know, the other thing to remember the demand and new, new, new hotels and hotels that are not going to reopen, you know, the market has shrunk slightly. And I think some of the new hotel openings might get postponed. So, you know, uh, the development cycle was so high and so many new hotels, especially in New York City coming in, that this adjustment will help the recovery a little bit. All right. So I'm going to pick on you. You've opened up Pandora's box to growth and new development. So you, you guys have a list. You've got your, you know, Hawaii and San Francisco and Nashville and I'm playing on some of the others, but you've got your list of developments that were in the pipeline. How's your pipeline looking and is it going to change? You know, uh, we are opening Toronto. Uh, it was ready to open in December, but we just pushed it to open it in, in probably late May, early June, because uh, it, it first quarter is tough to begin with in Toronto anyway. So that's ready to go. You know, the team is in place. We're just chomping to bit to open. Our hotel in Nashville will open in November. Um, and again, we have seen great leads from a group perspective uh, in that hotel. That city is a very big group and citywide and, and fourth quarter should be great. And, and that's going. Hawaii will open first quarter of 22 and fully under construction. And you know, we can't have enough resorts, even with or without pandemic. I think that hotel will do extremely well. Our London hotel is under construction and, and full on uh, happening. You know, the two hotels we have in San Francisco are kind of on hold right now. I mean, we have planned it, we have designed it, uh, but our partners and our owners are wanting to see what's going to happen with the San Francisco landscape. I am sure it will get done. Uh, and I'm not uh, worried about that pipeline, but you know, we have, tons of projects that we haven't announced yet that have 
executed HMAs and, and you know, from Florida to Greece to Paris to all the way to Maldives. Uh, so there's uh, there, uh, Manchester, Copenhagen. You know, so we have about 10 projects that we haven't announced yet uh, that we will start announcing in, in, in due time. All right, so I, I love this. Let's pick on global ho hotel markets. So how do you think, and as it changes this pandemic, how has it changed your thinking? Which markets are gonna be more be gonna benefit, and which markets are gonna hurt, in your opinion? You know, I don't know if you saw uh, the the first big concert that happened in New Zealand, right? Uh, and 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 there's thousands of people packed into a stadium three days ago. So you you look at that and then you say, what pandemic, right? And and you know, uh, American travelers have the shortest memory of, of any any culture that I know of, and 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 I think this pandemic, you know, in two years, God willing, will be. Oh God, yeah, we went through the hell and we're back now. So global travel, I don't think is gonna change as much. Uh, I think people, travelers will still want to go discover, the ones who like to discover and the ones who wanna be pampered, they're gonna go find places to be pampered and uh, business world will demand certain travel to the UK and other international destinations that they need to go. So, you know, this is a roadblock. This is a pothole that will get filled and then will be asphalt on top of it. And God willing, in two years, we'll, we'll think of it as a distant memory that we survived. So, you know, the international, we, we're looking at every city. We're looking at, you know, in Spain, we're looking at Italy. You know, we have a project that we are looking at in Florence, for example, that is seriously moving forward. Mexico City this is a project that we're looking at as we speak. So, we, we think that the right hotel with the right brand, with the right mission will make a difference. And, and we're, we're not just another box hotel. We have a hotel that provides a level of service and a mission that's different from the big boxes. And the fact that we haven't merged with one of the big hotel companies, the fact that we still uh, can create our own DNA and continue to evolve our own DNA and have someone like Barry at the helm, uh, gives us an advantage that is completely unfair to the rest of the hotel world. But you know, that's what we bring to the table. You know, you can talk to the CEO of a group, you can talk to the chairman of the group, and we're not too big. Uh, we can still make a difference at every single location. That was my plug. I should remember that for, for a commercial that I might do. <laughs> we'll mark that section of the tape just for you guys. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, cut. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you're not seeing a big shift like uh, let's get out of the urban, let's get out of New York and London and Paris and let's head to Florida. You're not seeing a major shift long term. That's a short term thinking, I think. I think long term we'll, we'll get back to normal. And I, I think some people are, are focusing on, on restaurants that are geared to no contact and designing, you know, to go and fast food places that are no contact. I mean, again, that's a great thinking, but it's a short-term thinking because this is not, in my opinion, a five-year problem. This could be a year problem and then we'll make it through it and we'll be safe and we'll be conscious of everything, decisions that we're making. But this is not something that, in my opinion, we have to you know, spend as much time in three or four years from now. So honestly, though, you guys are visionaries, right? I mean, Barry's done so much in, in the industry. You've been right there beside him. Uh, with the one brands, the treehouse, and and the and the uh, the operations that you're doing, so I, what, dare I ask, what's next? I mean, where are we heading uh, next? Our industry. What's I, next? I want to clarify something. Barry's the visionary and the executionary uh, of his vision. That's why we work well together. And and, and he is, you know, nothing ever uh, is enough. I mean, we always want to drive more, and we always want to deliver more. And then the fact that we have a mission. What's next for us is taking the mission of sustainability and, and growing it. There's a few big announcements that we have where we're going to make in the next uh, a couple of months uh, about our, our, our vision and mission from you know, our carbon footprint to our loyalty program that we're launching. And you know, we want to continue to be the best and continue to be nimble and make decisions that we can make in a, in a week where other companies could take months to, to decide on. And that's what, what differentiates us. We have the visionary in Barry, we have an incredible operating team. We have a team that actually likes each other and we, we spend time together and we laugh together, we work hard together, which is unusual in our, in our business to have. 
you know, there is no power struggle here at SH because, you know, we're here all for Barry. And, and, and he really, as our chairman and, uh, and our leader, really sets the tone and makes us all want to work harder. Arash, thank you. Thank you. You're a gem. My uh, pleasure, sir. Save me a hotel room in South Beach. I'll come see you. You know what? Anytime, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the light on for you, sir. Oh, I used another hotel company's uh, uh, logo, but we'll, yeah, we'll be ready for you, sir. There thank you. You're a great friend. Thank you for all you do for the industry. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you for having okay. me. Bye-bye.